Welcome back to the State of the Ark podcast. My name is Mike. My name's Kason. <sighs> All right, we're here to talk about Xenogears again for the 14th time, I think. The 14? <laughs> Something like that. Wow, we're getting along. Um, uh, we pretty much covered today everything after leaving Shabbat all the way up until arriving at Solaris. This, the save, the place I said to yeah. save this time was the first opportunity you get once reaching Solaris to save. So that's what we uh, covered for today. Um, so after leaving uh, Shabbat, you're basically headed straight to Nisan. Um, yeah. uh, and you discover upon arriving that Ave soldiers have overrun the place. All the people are gone. Yeah, everybody's completely missing, yeah. And so you have Bart and Faye and... Sigurd's there. Sigurd comes up and kind of reports yeah. about what's going on. Um, it seems that Shakan has come and uh, invaded, has uh, annexed uh, Nysan. Yeah. And we're not sure where the people have gone. And, and well, they... they Kidnapped Margie too, right? Is that what happened? Well, here? she that was she was there. She was on the ship, but she got worried and she kind of left. She left the Idrisil, but she hasn't been caught okay. yet by uh, by the Ave soldiers. And so um, you go in, you go through, and you kind of just like take out like all the soldiers that are kind of there guarding the place. You just like fight them all off and uh, yeah, basically make it safe in the the city itself. Um, and that's where we kill all the soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> kill them all. Everybody. Pretty much everybody. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like uh, Sister Agnes meets up with you and kind of explains the situation. Yeah, because we go to the cathedral, right? And there's like nobody there. Nobody's yeah. in the whole town. Everybody's completely missing. And so um, there was a, I, I made a note about this. There was a second sort of like narrated transition. The first one that we saw was in, yes. um, was in Shavat. Yes, with the wise men removing the limiters. Yes. And right. so the wise men thence removed <laughs> yes. the limiters. Yeah, that kind of thing, right? There yes. was another one. Yes. Right after taking out all of the uh, all of the soldiers in Ave. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> we're starting so to get them. I um there's one note about this that that I wanted to make here, and that is that there has been a little more clarification, or there was some clarification made back in like 05 by Soria Saga on who wrote like which parts of okay. the Xenogears script. And all of a sudden this started to make a little more sense to me. It's not so much, because you asked, oh, is this the start of them like running out of time and not being able to finish the game on time or whatever? Kind of feels like it. Feels and like they're rushing through some things. I feel like this, these examples are not necessarily that, but they really? are a stylistic choice of a different writer from the one who had written previous parts we've played. So we have like this okay. guy in charge of these sections and this guy in charge of these sections and we're seeing just somebody having a different kind of way Interesting. of stylizing how they present the scenes, right? Okay. So the okay. question came to uh, Soria Saga, who did actually write the script of Xenogears? And she said, Gears, mainly Tetsuya Takahashi did. I wrote the hmm. part of the script about Bart and his family, Billy and his family, and the former elements. Um, Mr. Kato, so Mazato Kato, wrote the part of Maria, Choo Choo, so the Shabbat section, <laughs> and uh, Lahan Kato. Village. And is this the Kato we mentioned last time? Who, yeah, he yeah. was he was a writer on uh, Chrono Trigger and a, a big uh, like story planner, story writer for Chrono Cross oh, cool. in particular. Um, so Lahan Village, Shabbat. Um, were two big ones for him. Hmm. Um, and then Maria's sortie scene was very impressive. She used to talk about the parts that she liked about what he wrote. And then Mr. Tanagashima, Tanagashima wrote the part of uh, Emeralda, the Yggdrasil's crews and the Element Girls. Um, so considering that the first time we saw this sort of narrated transition in the mm -hmm. game was in Shabbat, I'm going to guess that this is kind of a Mazato Kato thing who kind of carried over into this scene in yeah. Nisan as well. Kay. So I think that those sections are Mazato Kato inspired, the, the, the narrating stuff that we've seen so far. And that that then became a template to use to hurry through parts they couldn't They were like, hey, later. let's do it the way that that 
yeah. director had done it. Okay, cool. Because it just was the only way they can get through yeah. everything. It's weird when you have not that for the whole game, and then that starts <laughs> All of a happening. Sudden it starts happening. Um, yeah. I guess to some extent at the very beginning, after we see the intro, like anime movie, and then there's just some text explaining the world and mm -hmm. the ethos and who who's at war and who's not. Um, yeah, I guess that was right at the very beginning. That was yeah. at the beginning. We just haven't seen that for a while, and it just feels time. like a. Uh, like, uh, we don't want to show this, so we're just going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it does kind of like feel it. abrupt. Yeah. But um, I, think it's, I think it's a Mazato Katoism more than it is Kay. a running out of time in these instances. That's my, that's my speculation on that. Yeah, that's what I wrote. Now in Nissan, we're getting more of the same. Yeah. yeah. So then you meet up with Sister Agnes uh, in, like, the town hall building, and she starts to explain... Um, you know, kind of what's going on here. She, she sort of gives a reason for why Shikan was bold enough to do this. Um, I think what she says is, earlier, after everyone came out, over half the residents have fled from, nice, from Nisan. After that, Shikan's position in the country was compromised, so he didn't care about reputations anymore and attacked this land. Right, and, Shikan, and, Shikan's got like a, an, an, an end game strategy kind of thing going on here. He's kind of putting all his eggs into this one basket because he's been subtly subverting Gebler yeah. in different ways throughout. And one of them that we saw early on uh, is that he's looking for um, the the jewel, whatever you the call it. The Jasper. The Jasper. He's looking for the Jasper. And he has some info on what it is and where it is. Um, and so he's like going all out here now. If this fails, then he's done. Gebler's yeah. gonna kill him. Nobody is gonna allow him to return. But he thinks that if he can get the Fatima Jasper, then he can like challenge Gebler and, yeah. you know, what? With the, with the Fatima Royal treasure, which is an army. The treasure, yeah. yeah, the key to which is the Jasper, exactly. Um, but, uh, and this was mentioned earlier during like the Ethos headquarters scene, Mm -hmm. um, but is again mentioned by Shakan when we meet him here in a little bit. He was a member of the ethos himself. So, but he was of the yeah. He was a priest. He was earlier. of the um, the hierarchy that was trying to subtly break away from yes. Solaris. And he mentions this. He that yeah. there are different you know factions that want yeah. different things. But yeah, he was part of that group who had just been completely wiped out. Yes. So at, he, at the ethos headquarters, his time was coming. The, yeah. Um, what do they call him? The uh, the, the pontiff, I think. Oh the, yes, the yep. leader of uh, Ethos was like assassinated, and a yeah. bunch of the priests and stuff, who were part of this coup, not coup, but um, this group who were looking to break away from Solaris and actually yeah. end up like taking over. Um, so he was a member of that group, and they all got yeah. killed. So now, yeah, he, this is kind of his last ditch effort at this point. To survive. He needs to get the Omni gear real bad. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that's what he's doing here. Uh, and and uh, he's trying to get yeah. the Jasper so he can get down into the mausoleum where the, the Fatima royals are, like, buried. It's like yes. their burial grounds, kind of. Yes. So... This is interesting too. So um, they mention, oh, everybody, nobody's in town. Everyone's in the mausoleum. Yeah. Right? I'm like, okay, hey, that's interesting. Fine. But then Bart says, ah, well, the treasure is actually in the mausoleum, along with Father's will. I didn't tell anyone though. <laughs> da 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 da. <laughs> Almost yeah. as if it's just being brought up now out of convenience. Yeah. But you know, clearly this was planned ahead of time. It just wasn't. He it's didn't. almost as if we had forgotten all about the Jaspers and the Fatima treasure and everything. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, it's just been here the whole... There, there, it wasn't a grand reveal the way I thought it would be. It would sure. just be Bart just said, oh yeah, I guess I never told anyone. Yeah. But, here, but it's here, so let's go get it. Yeah. <laughs> also, what's uh, revealed through this conversation is that the Fatima Jasper is the former mother's retinas. Well, yeah, the, just the, the, the whole family line, they have these blue, topaz blue eyes. Yes. That, that can be read by like a retinal scanner. Now, I don't recall knowing about that earlier. But no, no. Yeah, Th this but is it's where shown it's revealed here. for the first time. So instead of a, a stone, it's like an eyeball, yes. basically. Like the, the eye is the stone. And um, this is where my thoughts first started going of the fact that Bart lost an eye, right? <laughs> where I'm like, okay. Then I thought, who he lost the eye 
with. Yes. And this is wrong, but I wanted to throw it out here anyways. <laughs> I thought, my initial thought was, oh my gosh, um, Sigurd, and Sigurd is a bad guy, and Sigurd lost his eye but stole Bart's eye, and under Sigurd's eye patch is Bart's other <laughs> eye. I was like, oh my gosh, he has the other... I, I was like half right that there's something to a Sigurd, you <laughs> sure, know? Sure. But I thought that Sigurd was just gonna... I'm, I'm not trusting anyone anymore. <laughs> I, I, I can tell. That's where I realized, once I realized I was wrong about this, yeah. I was like, oh man, I don't trust anyone in this game anymore. I have no <laughs> idea who to trust or what's going on now. But I really thought like Sigurd is totally a bad guy. He's playing it. And uh, he has Bart's other eye because he stole it because he knows the value and all that stuff. Yeah. So. Not quite, but but, but it's a one winged angel kind of thing. Yes, which is really cool. We're gonna yes. hit that up um, in a bit, but it is. So yeah, it's very I, cool. I took a couple of notes on this. So um, first, I thought it was really clever that they hid what the Fatima Jasper is yeah. by giving Margie like a necklace pendant. Yes, that that Where was all like, the oh, enemies the are other like half. that must be it. Yes. Where's the other one? That's right? very clever. It kept That's them all clever. like misdirected. The enemies yeah. were totally misdirected. Yep. And by calling it a jasper, by that gives mm -hmm. the image of some kind of jewel or something. Exactly. And it's like no, it's actually just the retinal pattern of this family line. Right. right? And uh, 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 I mean, lucky them that that retinal pattern was not a recessive <laughs> trait. <laughs> Right. It, it is manifest <laughs> in the phenotypes of all descendants, apparently. So that's great. That's, that's lucky for them, good I suppose. For them. Although there may be another explanation for it. But, <laughs> but yes, uh, getting on to what you were talking about. Um, the anima animus uh, angel symbol with man yes. and woman meeting each other. The Which is all over symbol. the mausoleum. Once you get right. in there, you start seeing those statues kind of appearing mm -hmm. all over the place. Um, I took s several notes on this. Um, uh, first of all, that Bart... It's, it's clear that Bart needs to develop his anima more. <laughs> um, when, yes. he, when they were kind of deciding on who's going to go where, right? Obviously, he's going down in the mausoleum. Faye, you're coming with me. Yeah. You pick whoever else. Uh, everyone else go with Sigurd to retake Bledovic. Now yes. that Chakan's in kind of disarray and he's all desperate and he's got a lot yeah, of his forces the here. Now's the chance. Let's yeah. go take that back and we'll go here. Um, uh, Margie is like, wait, I'm going too. I'm going with you, yeah. obviously. Yeah. to her and he's like huh you don't have to and he's like oh yeah because <laughs> he realizes yes. like he can't get in without he her can't do it because he only own. has one eye yes so she has the same retinal pattern and so she has to he has to rely on her the two mm -hmm. of them man and woman together uh to have both of their eyes scanned to complete the jasper which will allow them to get in my initial thought was well margie has Margie, just, Margie could just do it. She could right. just do it. That's true. But something happens to her later, which is where the it it, it is yes. cool how it ends up working out. I do yeah. appreciate it. It, it all kind of comes together in this yeah. way to where uh, it, it just pitches that symbol again, uh, the need of man and woman, animus and anima, um, coming yeah. together. Um, but at the same time, he just oh, I, and aren't they aren't they going to get married? Well, they're supposed to. I don't, the, I don't think I know, they like I'm talking gonna, about it. I know, but I like, don't think they like to think about that. Quite yes, yet. yes, but that is the idea. <laughs> but that is the idea. Okay. Um, and uh, he, I, I, I've sort of, I, I don't like the way he talks to her. <laughs> um, throughout yeah. the game, he's kind of been, you know, he's been kind of um, condescending or, or um, demeaning. In yeah. The way he, he calls her stupid and dumb. Yes, and, dumb idiot. And, and she kind of responds, well, oh, you're being so mean. Stop being a mean. Yes, that but it's, kind of it's very playful. The Japanese is quite playful, That's, actually. That is a perspective that I understand. And it, it, maybe reading it in Japanese gives it a different flavor. It's still, um, it's still bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it is that type of condescension between what are almost siblings. Siblings. It's more is sibling. actually more endearing than Americans would realize. That's what yeah. um, it feels like a little bit is like, uh, you know, uh, the the eight and and ten-year-old sibling arguing with each other all the time. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah, you dumb idiot. It, but there's a lot less not... emotion to it. It's a lot more, well, I don't really know how to explain it, but it's maybe... Well, Secret Garden, <laughs> you have Kim Juan and Oscar, right? Yes. It's kind of on that level, yeah. the way Kim Juan really talks down to Oscar, but they they are really close yeah. in in a 
in a certain way and they protect each other. Yeah. But just so condescending, you know. Right. But it's a brotherly thing. It's just it's just a little bit different when you think of it in, in terms of that and when you understand the culture just a little bit more. Right. And so... Um, I keep using Korean examples for what I say Japanese. <laughs> and I, I, re- I know that. I know that. But they're, they're similar. <laughs> Their cultures are similar. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it did strike me as uh, just a something that's in my mind because of, you know, all the union influences mm-hmm. that... Um, someone who's on the eve level of their anima development will mm. not necessarily treat uh, That's true. women that well or that they don't know how to communicate with them very well. Sure, right? yeah, yeah, of they, course. They kind of talk down to them and things like that. Yeah. That's what treat Bart as less useful. strikes me as, as this 19, 18-year-old guy Sure, yeah, yeah. Not great at this yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> not great at seeing the value it, in it, others. It really comes up later when, um, when Margie tries to pilot the Omni gear herself to help. Oh yeah, and he's standing behind her calling her stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's like, she's like hurt, right? I think she gets shot in the leg or yes, something. Yes, she does. And he, and he says, stupid, <laughs> why did you put yourself in danger like that? And she's like, oh, I thought this was the least I could do to help you. And he's like, dumb, <laughs> stupid, you're the biggest fool. And yes, just, yes, yes, yes. Really harsh. It is very when harsh. When she's like, it is so harsh. fatally wounded. <laughs> yes, but you know, um, how, okay, you know, Golly, man, you know, you know this, you know this, but just to explain this to everybody else, yeah. that it is, in Japan, the harder you are on somebody after they almost die, the more it means you love Care them, them, right? Yeah, and yeah. and that's more or less true in English as well, but it it actually, if it, it's more endearing, it would be less endearing if he didn't do that <laughs> in Japan. Um, you know when somebody almost dies and then... Certainly the parents of a child of a child who's yes. in serious danger will be almost like um, what angry you, what or... What thinking? Or, um, yeah, like, like how, what are you yeah. doing? Don't you ever do that again type of like uh, disciplinary Yeah, something like down. that. Maybe a little Mufasa to young Simba kind of thing. Yeah. The difference being after Mufasa's like... Come you down you disobeyed me. I'm mad at you. Get then away! He and turns his back on shows him. Shows how much you love. Then him. he offers yeah. an outpouring of of love, which Bart <laughs> never <Doesn't> does. Do. <laughs> Bart never does this, <laughs> and and it's a fair point to bring up. It yeah. is. It really is. And I, I'm not. And saying it was it, it was kind of weird for me to read too. But I, as soon as I thought of it in the Japanese culture, I was like, this isn't. It's bad, but it's just not like as horrible. I'm not even really bringing this up as a criticism of the writing. Yeah. I think it's actually good. Because mm-hmm. it ties into I see. Okay. the Jungian uh, anima development stuff of his character that I think could have been purposeful. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I don't like the way he's talking to her, but it doesn't mean that <laughs> like I don't on a personal think, level. I don't think it's ba- I don't think it's bad for the story or something. This is funny. To her this way. This is a similar criticism I had for Squall, where yeah. I was like, I don't like him, <laughs> and you were explaining. <laughs> Yes. You know, the character. And I was yes. like, yeah, but but, it, but it's him. And yes. it's, it's a funny character. I think it's a good choice for that character. And I think that character works within the way that they do the Enneagram types and uh, the way that the, the union philosophy or, or psychology works into this. It's just that yeah. it, it's tough to read because I feel for her. Yes. Because of I know how she feels about him and he, he, the way he's yeah. talking to her. I, I could see that being very difficult or, or almost traumatic to hear. Yeah. She, she takes it in stride well, and she seems to understand. That's part of what helps it to kind of land better is that he's yeah. calling her stupid and she's just like, yeah, well, you know, and not like really hurt by it, you yeah. know? So anyways, just something <laughs> that I took a note on. Yeah, that's good. It's not like, you know, the super most important thing, but I thought it was interesting. Um, so they go down into this mausoleum and yeah, they have to both scan their eyes to get in. Yep. It's all powered down uh, when you first enter. Yeah, There's everything's no really dark. Yeah. Uh, it's dark, you're kind of going through. There's no random battles. I really like that. Where you, mm. you could go through and learn the layout of this dungeon map. Yeah, running in the circle. Before the being interrupted by um, enemies. battles and enemies and stuff. Yeah, I, like, I really like that. So <laughs> I, I, this was the first time yet in the game where I could get a really good sense of direction for the map. Okay. Um, without the interruptions, without getting lost. And being ah, like, oh, where nice. am I? Where have I gone? I got a really good feel for how this place was. I ran around all the places, went in all the rooms. No interruptions. Too. Okay, I know where I'm at. No matter where I am, I know how to get back to the elevator. 
I know where this is at, I know where the control room is, I know, I, I got a really good sense for my surroundings in this place. Um, so I kind of like that. Um, any other uh, people designing JRPGs out there, uh, you know, maybe keep this in mind as a, as a flavor, a, a different flavor for a dungeon, to have yeah. it be yes. uh, seemingly peaceful. Let people run around. Let yeah. them run around and explore. Maybe there's a few doors that power can't, you can't open because of the power yeah. down. Yeah, and then yeah. power comes back open up. Open it all up. The torches get lit or something, yes. and then the enemies come out, and then you can kind of go through and have the... That's true. The I, I basically never see that. That's very... Yeah, very I, cool. I like it. Um, but uh, what's really cool, and I... Because I, I, um, after you get the power restored, right, uh, you go back into the, like, the... The, the main, command, the center. The command room. Oh, with all the buttons. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, the, the actual structure itself, the mausoleum, surfaces above the mm -hmm. ground and is sort of floating there. And I wanted to ask you, did you notice anything about... Yes, that? I did. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a thing that we saw at the very beginning of the game. Um, but it looks specifically like the command place where the dude was, the captain. Right? So I'm going to just, I'm going to put this on screen. And then they get shot down by... Oh, no way! Now I did not. I thought it was because I saw the, com the command center and it looked similar to this. Yeah. It's the actual cannons, the guns of the Eldridge. So it's the defense system of the Eldridge yeah. is what the mausoleum is. Now, let, uh, there's one wow. other thing I wanted to look at here is, uh, does it show them like actually coming up out of, yeah, like out of these little holes here? See the, how it kind of comes up like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they sort of fire. Jew. This is the mausoleum. Wow. One of these things <laughs> is, is the mausoleum. That's the structure. So I thought it was the command deck because they kept calling it the bridge, and it looked yeah. similar to where, you know, the captain was. Yeah. Um, but it's this. It's one of these. One That's of these super cool. one of these gun things, one of these cannons that shot down all of those ships. I should watch the intro again soon. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, that is uh, actually what this structure is that was underground that they were using as a burial ground mausoleum wow. for their Fatima royal family. And apparently there's a uh, multiple of those probably. Yeah. So this came obviously detached from the hull of the Oldridge when it crashed yeah. and got like buried underground or whatever, right? And it yep. was discovered by people at some point. Um, so anyways, really interesting. Um, but I also took note of the, the use of the, the track flight. Remember we talked about this last week? The, it uses the light motif of... Um, oh, the song, yeah, yeah. That uh, it was tied to Maria mm -hmm. and, and her father. They use that music, again, as this thing is coming out of the ground. <laughs> and it's just like, uh, what's avocado, what are you doing? Yeah, what, Anyways, does, it, what does it mean? <laughs> Interesting. I, I feel like this track is the most misused song in the whole game. <laughs> just over and over again. Because, you know... And, and I want to make this clear too, like, uh, it doesn't matter if you have a hundred track soundtrack like Suikoden or something like that, mm -hmm. Suikoden 2 or whatever it was. Even where you have like hundreds of tracks, you know, over a hundred tracks to use, um, you're going to reuse some of them oh, at yeah. some point. Yeah. Um, I just prefer that that be your stock danger music or stock escape music. Or stock not, sound not music. the character themes. Yeah, not the character theme. <laughs> or the used moment themes, yeah. And misusing some of the plays. Yeah. That's really all it is for me. Um, okay. So then you meet up with Shakan at that point. Yeah. I also mm -hmm. took my notes. Now, when you first played this game, how surprised were you that Shakan had been using you the whole time? Because oh. for me, it was this much. <laughs> <laughs> not surprised. One I had. I was not surprised. I took a note as I was playing this game. I said, as we go through this, I can't help but think Shakan is using us to get <laughs> at whatever the treasure is. Yep. And then, oh, wow, Shakan, such a surprise. Da, yep. Da, da. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask you about some of the Japanese and their conversation. Ooh. Because when you meet Look up with up. them, you're like surrounded by soldiers. And this is where Margie kind of like slips through and runs away to the gear. Yes. And it's like, oh, he, Shakan's oh, going to go after her while I he leads you to the soldiers. But while you're talking to him, he, he's explaining his plan and his part in the ethos and the fact that there are, you know, just because the ethos headquarters got taken out uh, doesn't mean, like, you know, his plans are necessarily ruined or whatever. He's explaining all this monologuing as villains tend to do. But yeah. Bart says something to him um, about killing himself honorably, that he should kill himself honorably, and what a fitting death for a clergyman. 
And I couldn't mm. help but think that this would feel more correct in Japanese where like seppuku was a, a concept in their culture. <laughs> While you're still honorable? Because like honorable suicide is really a very samurai Japanese thing, but it, it can feel a little out of left field in English. And so I was, I was just wondering if how he says that in Japanese because I, I, it just came across as a little odd to me in English. It says, well, why don't you just die? I mean, that's what this is telling me here. So instead of specifically seppuku, it just says here, this is she, this means to die. So, um, uh, shin demo shitara doda. So why don't you just die? Shin demo shitara doda. Does he, does he say that that's fitting for a clergyman or anything yes. like that? Yes, and then the next line here, yes, that is a more suitable end for the end of the priesthood, but specifically... For the end of the priesthood. Yeah, it's a, it's a more suitable death for a priest. It's a death more befitting of a priest. Yeah, sei shokusha no saigo ni fuzo wa shize. So... I'm just trying to think in what context that makes sense. So why don't you just die then? It's a more fitting end for a priest. <laughs> is that... How, how, well, actually, how that, good question. <laughs> how is that true, um, what he's saying? Do, do, in what culture is, like, suicide, like, appropriate for You're a right, you're right. So a, a priest I'm not saying rather, that that doesn't exist, I'm saying than, I don't know it. Rather than be revealed for how crooked you are, or rather than go back and be imprisoned in Ave because you're a, you're a, a failure, why don't you just kill yourself? That does seem like it's following that logic of the, the dishonor, like, the only yeah, way like, you can regain your honor is kill yourself. I, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm missing a piece of context about Japanese history or some other culture maybe where uh, priests commit some kind of ritual suicide I as don't, a form of honorable death. I don't believe so, but it does, it does follow just anyone in Japan. It, it's not just the samurai or anybody like that, it's anybody. If you do something wrong, now, I always have Korean examples for this stuff just because I've been studying Korean lately and not the Japanese. But when the Sewol ferry um, sunk, you remember that? There was a ferry going from southern Korea to Jeju Island, I think. And there were a bunch of students on it and about 300 people died because they overloaded it with stuff. That happened about four, four years ago maybe. And it kind of listed and it started oh, to take on water and the whole thing just sunk and killed like high school students, like tons That's of young people. Crazy. And the person who was in charge of the operation that decided that they were going to overload these uh, too much with, uh, they, were, they had like crates, like extra cargo was on it. Um, he killed himself like the next day mm. because it was not gonna be good for him. And like, he's just a business guy. He cut a corner, he knew he cut a corner. Everyone now knew he cut a corner. The only way for him to redeem himself um, and die an honorable death was, was to end his own life right then and there. And that's a that's ingrained in the culture, mm. so it's not. It, but I would say this didn't apply often to priests, but really anybody, just like me or you, okay. if we did something that brought our family shame, the only thing to do is to restore the honor, is yeah. to end our lives and start again through the reincarnation or something. Yeah, I mean that was obviously very strongly um, believed and and adhered to yeah. during the like uh, the the peak of the samurai and stuff. Yes, but, very much so. But it's, guess in but Asian it's still in general, but East Asia has some of the highest suicide rates in the world, and this is yeah. this is at least in part the reason why. Uh, like it's some really kind of um, remnant of that. Yeah, remnant of that. Yeah, because they don't really believe a lot of this stuff anymore. But yeah, yeah, there's a remnant left over, and I, priests are not exempt from you know the the culture. Okay. Anyways, That's all I got because mm. it's not like a priest thing. I, I don't was think just, you're missing much. I was curious because it sounded weird in English. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so at that point, uh, Margie had split to go pilot the Omnigear, and, and uh, there's another retinal scanner that uh, Bart needs to activate. Ah, uh, yes. Um, but he doesn't have Margie, so he's like, oh, I've only got one eye, what am I going to do? I can't do this. And Margie kind of just took off running to yeah. go make sure the treasure was safe, yeah. And so Sigurd steps up, and he's like, I can do it. And he's like, what? Like, how is On this On one possible? condition, don't ask me any questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so yeah. his good eye, but see, Sigurd's this is, good eye, I was Bart's like, oh, eye. he's going to flip up the thing and show <laughs> that he has Bart's other eye. I, I so thought that that was going to happen. But, uh, but it was just his natural just eye. His good eye. Sigurd genetically eye. Yep. has the has Fatima the, the, Jasper. The Jasper. Yeah. He's got the retinal pattern, naturally. And so Bart's like, 
wait a minute, how is that possible, right? And he's yeah. like, we don't have time for this right no now. No time, no time. So you go over and you, uh, or Bart runs into the Omni gear, and this is kind of that scene where I talked about where he's talking down to Margie. Um, but he's, he's trying to figure out how to pilot it. And he's like, there's no controls. Like, yeah. this is not like a normal gear. I don't know what to do. And this is where Saiten kind of puts it together that uh, remember how when Ellie passed nearby the uh, the Omni gear in Shabbat and it like responded to her? Yeah. This is like some kind of mental thing. You just think what you want the Omni gear to do and it'll do it. And it does. And, and this is, you know, we talked about in the other episode, I think a couple weeks ago. This is what. Nikolai Balthazar was trying to... So sort of like replicate, right? Yeah, was trying to like um, manufacture in Solaris where they mm. could just, uh, instead of like this natural mental connection with a gear, like um, this is kind of a like a trope of like mecha anime and stuff, you know, that yeah. you have to like sync with the with the gear. It's like you are one with the machine yeah. kind and of Yeah, and they thing. explain it a little here, some technical things where it's like the thought between thinking you're going to shoot and then shooting, that's it. There's a there's a latency there. Yeah. The the signal needs to go to your arm, and then your arm needs to shoot. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if the signal just went straight to the gear, yes. and the gear just did it instead of putting a middleman, which is yes. your physical body, in between? Right. And so they explain it like this is part of what makes these gears so powerful. They're so quick. You can yeah. react so fast because right. you just think, and it and it happens. And so that's what Nikolai Balthazar was trying to like manufacture yeah. for their soldiers. But this is a natural mental connection. So Bart is just able to think, and the gear just responds to what he thinks. And yeah, and which is fight. great, because this is how um, Margie was able to use it, was that she was just sitting in the gear, and they started to attack her. And she was just like, ah, no, don't do it. And just that reaction, like yeah. that powerful emotion of, I'm going to die, something save me, uh, activated the gear to actually do right. it, right? And so it's like, you've got to be really... Intense. Same thing with Bart. He sits there, doesn't know what to do, but as soon as they attack him, he like is able to pull off some some yeah. thing that he doesn't even defends, know. Defends. Yeah. Defends himself against the beam from the Etone enemy there. So yeah, uh, you beat people up. You you uh, <laughs> you, you beat Shakan back, right? You don't kill him yet, but you beat him back. Um, so the it's a success. We obtained the Omni Gear, the treasure, uh, royal treasure. Yeah. And there so, is um. There is one other Japanese thing here that um, I, one of them at some point says out of the frying pan and into the fire. Yes. I got very curious as to what the Japanese was there. And it's almost the same expression, but not quite. Okay. It's uh, mizu, mizu kara hi no nakani. So from the water to the middle of the fire, which uh, is from water to fire, but I believe it's referencing boiling like water. Like boiling. Yeah. Like a pot. Because at first I was like, water to fire. Okay, like you're drowning, and then you're not drowning, but now you're... But I, I believe it's probably more of a reference to you're boiling in the water and you fall in. So it's very close. Um, but often these analogies are, are very different. So yeah. this one's actually pretty close. Pretty close. Uh, that's when, when Chakan is commenting on the fact that Margie slips past. So yes, Margie and, like yeah. gets past and he's like, whoa, where's she, where's she going? Out of the yeah. frying pan hey guys, the fire. Kind go of get thing. her. Yes, yeah. he's using a lot of those kind right. of sayings. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> so we get, the, we get the Omni gear and we're meeting up to talk about what to do next. Um, so Sigurd then informs the party that there is a Solaris gate generator nearby. They've uh, they've gathered some intelligence, and there's this cave real yeah, close to Nice. Yeah, just like right west of them. And yeah. they're like, down in that cave <coughs> is one of the one of uh, Solaris's gate generators. So we should go take that out, because if they're they're trying to find a way to get to Solaris now that they have taken back mm. um, Bledovic, they've taken back Ave. Um, <coughs> Because that was the plan from the beginning, right? It uh, was. I, I had heard words, I can't remember which ones, but of um, there were keys. There were some certain keys, or maybe they said, was it Keeper? I swear it was a key that they had referenced. Um, but... At which part? Um, there's a word for it. It's not Solomon's key. Was it Solomon's key? It was a different... Oh, Geisha key. Geisha key. We, I don't... I, Maybe the Gazo Ministry that, right? has said something about that. Okay, so far. in which case, who freaking knows? But <laughs> I thought we It'll were going to unlock more. the gate, but it seems like we just destroyed the whole gate. The completely. gate generators. <laughs> we it, just it's, it's kind of the same thing that away we happened with, with Shabbat, where, um, what's her name? Dominia had like diminished its potency, it went down to like 70%. 
and that allowed some of the enemy gears to kind of get through and target uh, the gate generators on Solaris, and that's what we defended with our four gear guys. Yeah, we defended those gate yes, generators. Yes, that's right. That's right. So that they wouldn't be able to get their whole force in. Um, so it's that same kind of it's technology. the same concept. Where we're yeah, going yeah. to we're going to damage or destroy these gate generators. That will lessen the strength or potency of Solaris's gate, and with Siebson, it is powerful enough, it's cannon to, to just like blast through, yeah. Bust through it and get us in. That's kind of their plan here. So uh, they head over there, <clears throat> go in, and it's pretty short, there's just a couple rooms. Yeah, super um, short. And you fight Chakan in, in his gear in there. And you know, he kind of goes on a, some diatribe here about uh, how like Ethos was managing these, these gates, uh, gate generators, not yeah. really knowing what they were but they found some other purpose for it. Mm. And he's like gonna unveil that to you now and he like connects his gear to the gate generators to draw power. To get power. extra power, yeah. But then like there's some kind of malfunction or it's not working as it should. Right. And he's like, no, how could this happen? There should be no errors. And Bart's like, if my dad knew that this idiot was like. <laughs> Who's the one who tricked us? He would like, <laughs> he would like turn his grave or something like that. <laughs> And then, That's um, so funny. and then Graf shows up to do his "Do you want the power?" speech for like the third time in the game now, um, and so gives Shakan some a boost, an, a needed boost to face us, which doesn't work. We fight him and kill him anyways. Yeah, we fight him and kill him. <clears throat> he wasn't too hard, but um, I uh, learned. I don't know if I should say this at this point, but I learned a thing that okay. I believe to be the case. Okay, um, here's what I'm going to do about this, because there have been. Some people, I don't want to. I don't want to do this too much. Uh, uh, look, okay, this is a. Uh, hold on to what you're saying. This is a total tangent for a second. Okay, <laughs> I'm really trying my best not to say too much and to spoil or ruin future twists or something like that. Um, there are some people who think I'm doing that, despite the fact I've defended myself mm, in a couple of episodes ago. All right. So. Um, I will try, and, and here's what it is. Here's what I realized where you might have gone wrong. Well, I like, I get a kick out of guessing yes. <laughs> what's going to happen. I want you to still be able to voice and guess what you're thinking. Because and, that is what the story has led me and to, And maybe right? at some point you'll guess things sooner than other people. So we mm, will put, yeah. we'll try to put more spoiler warnings in places where you are going to guess at a thing. <laughs> Despite the fact that I may be completely you may be wrong. wrong. <laughs> but even because <clears throat> some people are just very sensitive to spoilers. And my default answer to that, my default answer, is if you, if you are that sensitive to spoilers to where you don't even want to hear someone who hasn't played the game before <laughs> guess at the answer, and you want to know nothing, uh, you probably shouldn't watch the podcast. You probably shouldn't watch any videos. You should play the game first and then come back. If you're kind of more like me, and you don't want to know like the major twists ahead of time, but but you do like to make sure that you're picking up the setups. The breadcrumbs. You want to make sure that you're yeah. on the right track so that you'll understand the context when it comes up, then this podcast might be good for you. If you're not as sensitive to that stuff, like I'm not, right? this is probably a good format. If you really don't want that, don't watch, but I will also try harder to put up more spoiler warnings for this kind of thing that you're about to do. Kay. So here it is, that's the warning. Well, we'll put I, I could just say something along <clears throat> the lines of, I don't have to say what it is. Yes. What if I just say, I think I know who Graf is now? Okay, you think you know who Graf but is now. But I don't have is to the say non -spoiler, <laughs> Is the non-spoiler version. Now look at the <laughs> description for the time code so you can skip okay. past the part where he actually makes the guess. Go ahead. Well, but here's the thing, though, because I don't want you to tell me. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> okay. I'm not even going to look at you. Well, but then what's the point? See, now I'm starting <laughs> to wonder. I'm starting fun, to wonder. Because it's fun for people. Like, it's fun. I have a guess. But how about... <laughs> <laughs> how about I um, just say that I'm pretty sure I know and just leave it at that? Well, if you, it's but up to I'd you. I'd like to explain how and why it's, I know. It's up to you. Um, because I know that you have a sensitivity to spoilers yourself. I do. So I it's do. up. So it's up to you. But I do think that it's fun for people watching, whose faces you can't see while you say this, to see people putting the pieces together and how they're going about it. Okay. Um, so I think it's worth doing if you're willing to do it. If not, that's also fine. Okay. 
Uh, I think Graf is Faye's dad. Okay. And I think that for several reasons, one of them being Wiseman and the limiters. So what I think Graf is doing when he shows up giving people the power of the fist of the Garden of Eden, or the, <laughs> whatever he does, it's the thing. He's got the whole spiel, right? The, yeah. whole, poet, the whole poetic thing yeah. he says. Yeah. He, he's removing the limiters from Shikan, as far as I can tell. He's like, oh, don't worry. I can give you real power that's already inside of you. The, the innate power you were born with. And I'm thinking the only people I've seen do that are the wise men. And the wise men, who we don't know of yet at the moment, I think, is Faye's father. And uh, thinking back to the anime video shot movie um, with the colors, the red and the blue, um, I think I'm seeing some, some symbolism here in that Faye, his dad, and then um, Graf and uh, Id, are kind of all having a face off. Faye's just kind of there, he's being passive. But um, Graf is there, and in between Graf is Faye's father, and Faye's saying, I won't let you have him. It's possible that Graf is uh, Faye's father's id, whereas id is Faye's id. Anyways, that's kind of where I'm going right now based on this, just based on this scene here. Once I see him giving someone the power again after knowing about limiters and about the wise men and knowing that wise man studied with, Faye's dad. Um, I'm sort of wondering if Faye's dad has kind of been taken over by his, you know, alter ego. Okay, so that's where I'm at now. And okay. You don't have to say anything. So, um, one thing, a, a couple things I want to say uh, okay. regarding just Wiseman in general, right? Um, when you brought up Wiseman's name and the fact that he could be part of the Wiseman of Xenogears, I was like, oh, fetch. That's so. <laughs> that's so. Easy. How did I not see that? <laughs> but there's something more to this. Uh, yeah. The the three wise men of like the Christmas story, right? The three kings. Yes. Yes. Their Very names gifts. are Melchior, Gaspar, and Balthazar. Mm. Um, and then th these names were used in Chrono Trigger as the three. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Actually. Uh, the three uh, figures from the the time of antiquity that went to the super future or to mm. the present or to I can't remember the one. You went to some other time period. Whatever. Um, they went to all different time periods, and you meet the, oh, one is at the end of time. Yeah, who's standing underneath the lamp at the end of time. So Melchior, uh, Jasper, or Casper, and uh, Balthazar. So we've met Balthazar uh, down in Ave's desert. And then Jasper. <clears throat> and Jasper. So then wise man would be Melchior. Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I legitimately don't know. I don't remember this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but... Um, in any case, uh, yeah, I never put it together that his name is Wise Man. I always thought it was a weird name, Wise Man. Wiseman. Because Weisman. he could be a member of the, the these Wise Men. Who there may be more than three. I I I I'm legitimately don't know at this point. I don't Kay. remember this. I don't what, remember whatever Wise Men is. When or he if studied we meet, with Faye's father, and yeah. they have similar skills. Right? I don't remember when or if we met. When or if we will meet Melchior in this game, I have no memory of that. Um, so I'm as lost as you, or would be guessing <laughs> to try to make a, a, to give an answer to that. Okay. But um, yeah, it, 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 it has occurred to me that there may be more than the three wise men in this game, okay. or there may just be three. I just don't remember. <laughs> because if Faye's father isn't a wise man but he has the power of the wise men, then that's good enough for, for what sure. I'm, for my theory, right? Sure. As long as he has the ability to remove limiters, which as, as of now, I believe only the wise men could do. But Faye's father and wise man were basically the same person, so. Right. In fact, so, yeah. Okay. Um, end of spoilers, I guess, now, at that point. <laughs> okay. Cool. So, um, Fetch, where were we? Uh, we destroyed the gate, the, the gate generator, and we killed Chicago. Finally, Shikan's dead. Yay! All, all. What's that song? All something. The witch is dead. Oh, uh, do what? What is? Wait. How does it go? Ding dong. Ding dong. Ding witch dong. Is, witch ding is dong. Dead. Ding dong. Shikan is dead. <laughs> ding dong. <laughs> uh, finally. Oh. So then now you can go back to now they go back to Bledovic and and uh, Bart gives a speech. Bart has a speech, but before that, so when they're we're in the cave and Bart is talking about how. Because uh, I think we had a hard time getting in at first or something like that. I can't remember exactly what happened. But Bart says something about how, no, 
we've got to do this other because it'll be an, an eternal embarrassment if we don't. Do you yes. remember seeing those words, eternal embarrassment? I think so. As if like, hey dude, we don't have to chase down Shikan, like it's no big deal, like just let him go, he's screwed. Like yeah. he has nowhere to go, he, he lost, it's over. Um, but Bart is like, no, it'll be an eternal embarrassment. Uh, what did he say? Eternal embarrassment if we let them get away. So he's like, we have to let them get away so that I'm not embarrassed, right? <laughs> but that's not what he says in Japanese because that just sounds a little funny. It's not that. In Japanese, the word he uses is matsudai, which is more like shame than embarrassment. Uh -huh. So what he's really saying, it's not that sure that he'll be embarrassed. <laughs> it's that he'll be shamed eternally. He's like, yeah. I'll suffer eternal shame if we do not, you know, fix this. So it's a... I get that maybe why he didn't want to use the word shame. We don't really use that in English so much. Um, but embarrassment doesn't give the right context, the right yeah. connotation to the word. It's not it's, strong enough. It's shame. He, he'll be shamed, not embarrassed. Yeah. He's <laughs> bringing shame funny. to the whole family. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> which is a very, again, samurai Japanese thing. Exactly. Um, so I was a little bit confused by this. I, I still am. I still can't really... I have a guess, which I'll go through as to what what results from this speech but um i was i was very confused at first Me so too. he's speaking to the people and he's talking about how his father's final wish mm. was to make it a republic but his father didn't make it a republic right it was just his wish it was his <laughs> dying wish that when they recapture it yes. that that ave be made into a republic yeah. and no longer a monarchy i think now that's that sounds right. So okay, what that's that's what good guys do in RPGs. They make things into a yes. democracy or a republic. Yes, or they have to. Yes, exactly. Um, fine. After he's done giving the speech, uh, Sigurd and Mason are like shocked. <laughs> like, yes. What are you doing? I think I think Sigurd uses the word unbelievable, which is <laughs> really funny. <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Well, in part for Bart, he's like, you guys came all the way with me to help make me the king, and I just abdicated. <laughs> just abdicated the first chance again. Now, part of this is Bart has to come with the party. He can't be a king and stay here and rule. He's right. got to come with us. He's the constraints gotta. of the RPG means he has to come. Exactly, but, exactly. But um, Sigurd says... Um, oh, oh, shoot, the people love say? you, right? I think he's saying... What I think Sigurd is saying is, is can't, yes, it's a republic, but they're going to elect you to be the president. Can't you hear the crowd outside? They have chosen you as their king. Exactly. You're going to be very busy. And Bart says Sig with dot, 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 as yes. if he's like, uh, like giving into it or doesn't know how to respond or something like that. And then Sig says, won't you need some capable assistance? And that scene ends, and I'm going, wait. Is it a republic or is it a monarchy? Because is he the king or not? He I comes with us. <laughs> he comes with us. Like he's not doing his kingly stuff. So I, my, I took that as it's no longer it's a republic now. But Sigurd is telling him yes, but in republics they vote on who they want to lead, and right. it's you. And this is where I did a little bit, like a very little bit of research on this. Yeah. Right. So like modern republicanism is very anti-monarchy, which is yes. why I was confused by this. Because it's like, do you mm. have a monarchy or do you have a republic? I don't understand. But in classical republicanism, it was more about limiting the power of monarchies, not necessarily abolishing them outright. Mm. So it's possible that yes, he is still the king and also it is a republic because they elect their king, mm. if that makes sense. Which was a concept that I was, I have just never thought it's existed. It's not a king if you elect him, but you know. Well, you don't vote for kings? You don't is, vote. <laughs> is what I was thinking. I didn't vote for you. <laughs> you don't vote for kings. <laughs> but apparently you did vote for kings um, okay. in some classical mo or Republican, uh, republic, republics. Republics. In some classical republics, I guess it was about limiting monarchies. I mean, they, they have a monarchy huh. in... In in Great Britain, England, yeah, yeah, right. So it's not so powerful. It's but, it doesn't yeah. actually hold any like real power over the, no. the parliament. No, but that has diminished over time. I mean, yes. like they used to have more influence than they do today, and yeah, and that same thing with Japan. Japan has an emperor. Yeah, um, but has basically no power. It's basically just an ambassador now, a world so, ambassador. So what I'm guessing here yeah. is that it is still a technical monarchy, and that. He is still the king of Ave, mm -hmm. but 
there is also, that, that power is not so centralized anymore. It is divided okay. among what I would guess are elected leaders and the king is a part of that. Maybe, maybe uh, another parallel within Xenogears can be made to this with Emperor Kane's level of influence over the Gazelle Ministry or something. Hmm. Like obviously he's They're the a little Emperor more totalitarian Kane, but there. the Gazelle Ministry still have a lot of say. They can mm -hmm. disagree, they can move on their own. Um, yeah. It's, it's not like Emperor Kane is like, like the end stop for absolute ultimate hmm. power within Solaris's government. And maybe that's what they're referring to here is you're still the king, but you're not the king. Okay, but, but either way, he comes with us. Be so he's yes. not there. Uh, and and this, they elaborate, well, not really elaborate, but there, another hint about how this potential government might work <laughs> is that um, at night, he's, he's really uh, now preoccupied, Bart is, with trying to figure out who Sigurd is. Uh, mm -hmm. because he could use his eye in the retinal scanner, right, with the Jasper. So he goes and asks Mason first, and, and Mason explains, well, your father, before you were born, he loved this girl. There was from, this other girl. Yeah. From the east of Ignis or whatever, or west, I can't remember which. Anyways, um, had a son. Yeah. So And uh, then Bart's like, so my dad left her? And it's like, no, it's the other way around. She left him. She left him. Right. And so, anyways, Sigurd was is like the the firstborn bastard son of Edbart uh, the fourth, <laughs> Bart's father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he's like his half brother, right? Yeah. So he goes out and he talks to Sig, and he's basically explaining to him that father's wish it was well, obviously to make Ave into a republic. Yeah, but his, he, his the will, way, right? The way that he. Um, puts that is that I, he was to split his inheritance with his brother mm -hmm. and with the people. Yeah. So And it never made sense to him because he didn't know he had a brother. Yeah, he didn't know he had a brother. Yeah. So I'm guessing that the power structure of Ave now is going to be like Sigurd, Bart, and some elected group of... That represent the people. Yes. And they have equal power. And they all have equal power. Mm. That's my best guess at what the fetch just happened in Ave, because I don't know. <laughs> hey, that's a good that's a good political observation. I don't how know. It might work. I have no idea because it was way not clear in the speech and in the dialogue that followed. So. No, the, it was clear to the people though. They were stoked. They were like sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were they were very excited, and they voted for him to be king. So apparently, you can vote for kings. Um, <clears throat> so there you go. So, but now they have to decide how to destroy the other two gates. And what they do know is that the formation of where these gates are located is in a triangle, it's a triangle yeah. formation. So they destroyed the one up near Nysan, and they know that the next one is, is under Ethos. the Ethos headquarters. Yeah. And so, so based on that, they have a 50-50 on yeah, where the third one is. There's two possible locations of the third. Yeah. But they want to go after the Ethos headquarters one first. And um, they're trying to decide how to destroy it. And they said, well, we have what's called Fort Jasper now, which is the cannon from the Eldridge, yeah. right, um, that we were talking about. Um, we, that probably has the firepower, but it's not located in the a place angle. Yeah. that we can actually fire on it. We'd need to come from above. And this is where, I don't know, this, I think this is something you can miss on your first time going up through the Babel Tower, but there's... Um, <clears throat> like a little control center as you're climbing it. You have to get out of the gears and go in there on foot and you can press some buttons. I did that the flips first. like a mirror yes. thing out. <clears throat> yeah. So that's where Saiten would have gone, aha, uh, there are these like mirror structures on the Babel Tower. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can position these in such a way to where when we fire the cannon from Fort Jasper, it will reflect the beam down straight into the Ethos headquarters and we right. can destroy it like that. They're like, cool, we'll split into two groups and Bart and his team will go to Fort Jasper. Uh, Billy will be the one to fire it because he's the gun guy. And then <laughs> yes. Faye and Sighton will go <laughs> over this way and uh, go you know, position this mirror. Um, and so what, af as they decide to do that and they're moving out, we get another um, scene with the Gazel Ministry. And, um, yeah, this one's interesting. They're where, just ripping on, yeah, what's his name? Ramses. On Ramses, holy cow, dude. So, I want to bring up the Enneagram again. Ramses deals with it okay, though, as far as I could tell. 
didn't like like he was best, but it well, didn't he like was, break his world at the time. He's um, he's definitely not going to show it to them if mm, right. uh, what he's feeling. But I want to bring this up right here. So Ramses, in my estimation, is a type three, which is actually a lot of the elements are type three. It's almost mm. like a lot of the villains in this game are type three. <laughs> is type three a villain personality? <laughs> type three is a villain personality <laughs> in Xenogears world. Sorry to all you threes. <laughs> So, um, type three is the achiever performer. Um, their ego fixation is vanity. Their holy idea is hope and law. Their basic mm, fear yeah. is worthlessness. Um, and their basic desire is to feel valuable. So uh, this is what I feel, uh, I mentioned earlier, I feel Hammer is this type. Oh yeah. Um, I feel like a couple of the Elements members at least are this type, uh, uh, Dominia and, uh, Dominia in particular. Mm. But. Which is why I think that she is so loyal to Ramses because Ramses is this mm -hmm. type. They understand each other. Yeah. Right? Um, the temptation pushing uh, self to always be the best, right? Um, this is something that Ramses has been kind of obsessing about regarding Faye since the first time he met him. Mm. If you remember um, in that episode where he sees Faye for the first time, he's like, whoa, wait a minute. He looks different now. What's going on? And like, it kind of cuts away, or there's text over the screen that says um, worthless or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he has this sort of like recollection of someone telling him, we can gather now from this scene, that he's worthless and he's so, so traumatized yeah. by that. And he's going to do anything to prove he's not worthless. So, his fixation on Faye. And his like, because before he seemed to be a very grounded uh, military commander, very in command of himself. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as, anytime Faye is mentioned, he flies completely off the handle. Yeah. And yeah, I guess I still don't know exactly why that is other than... I guess he's 500, 100 years old also. Oh, oh. Well, apparently a lot of people are 500 years old <laughs> in this game. What, what, we, what we do know from the information we do have, the information we can gather, he was there when... On that day, when, 500 um, years ago. No. The day the, the strength of men demon failed. Of, the demon of <laughs> Elru. <laughs> uh, when, when his gears and his guys were all getting killed by, yes. by Id, right? Yes. Id was flying around beating gears up and, and he was trying to fight back and his Graf was watching, silhouetted by the red moon. <laughs> you know that scene? Yes. So he obviously has some kind of intense rivalry with Id, who we now know is Faye. Um, and he feels worthless because of this person. Like he feels, um, what do you call it? Insecure or like inferior in some way. And he's mm. out to prove that he's the best. Yeah. That's his goal. So he and just every time Faye comes around, I head. have to prove I'm the best. And so every time he has encountered mm. Faye in the game so far, he has lost miserably. Yes. And in particular, in Ave, Ave, right at the end, right before you get into Kislev, yes. when the red gear shows he up, is just he got his arms ripped off. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> annihilated. Yeah. Like, so he's yeah. fetching pissed about the fact that he cannot seem to overcome Faye, right? So the vice or passion is deceit, the virtue is truthfulness and authenticity. Stress uh, disintegration with nine, which is phase type. Phase, yeah. So when he gets stressed, he becomes more of a nine. Yep, and the, the reverse is true too. When, yeah. Well, Faye goes more towards the six, but this, the six and the nine and the three are all connected. Yeah, they're all connected. The dull triangle thing, right? Right here, this symbol, triangle. Yep. So anyways, with that being established, yeah, the Gazo Ministry are calling him trash and useless yes. and all of these things that he's most afraid of being. <laughs> um, the word they use for trash in the Japanese is the word jim, which means dust or dirt. Yeah. It also means trash, but the connotation is dust, which has a biblical reference, uh, unto dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return, something along those lines. Yeah. Um, because he was, he was a lamb, right? Yeah. Who kind of rose up into the ranks. Yes. And then they're just reminding him Actually, that he is... 
just nobody. Isn't Ramses? I can't remember if well, Ramses is pure Solarian or not. I think he might be. But he okay. was lower He was lower class in Solaris. Ah, so it wasn't that he was a lamb. He was just low class. He was low class in Solaris. And he like, wanted to like change. Like Sighton was. Sighton and he were in the lower class of Solaris. Okay. And he wanted to turn it in front, instead of this, like, um, this hierarchy of like a class structure, he wanted to turn it into more of this meritocracy. I thought they were <laughs> all from... Sigurd from was from Earth because yeah, he was so Sigurd got kidnapped. The the, the the firstborn son of the king of yes yes Ave, and he got kidnapped. But right. Sighton and Ramses were born. In oh Solaris. okay okay. okay. <clears throat> yeah. So they're just reminding him of how low he is, I guess. Yes. In that sense. Um, and so he takes this very personally, but he can't really do anything because he's injured from the last encounter right. with, with Faye. Um, but he's still he's still going to. He wanted to. Well, Miang kind of talks him out of it, yes. but he's like ready to go. Ready to go. Yeah, and the gazelle just don't care. They're like, whatever he does, we don't even care. Like, he can go do it, sure. They didn't like kill him right then. Yeah. But they're just like, we're done with him. And this is where the elements kind of come up and like, please let us do this for you. They, yeah. They're very loyal to him. And yes. uh, endeared to him, and so they're going. Kind of makes to, you feel bad when, <laughs> yeah. when everything doesn't work for him again. Yep. And so the elements say, "Don't worry. Like we'll go. We'll go take right. this for you. We won't let them destroy the second gate." So they split up. And so go, we destroy the second gate, <laughs> and then <laughs> what happens after that? <laughs> I feel bad for Ramses. I really do. Yeah. He has like a rough. He's doing his best, and he's apparently really good. But he's up against powers that he does not. Fully understand. I think that you're meant to feel that way about Yeah. Ramses. I think he's meant to be a sympathetic villain in, in kind a of, lot of ways. Kind of pitiful. And um, <clears throat> I mean, that, that kind of really really ties into his Enneagram too. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, Dominia and Kelvina go to the Babel Tower and uh, forget the names of the other ones. Talone. Oh, Talone and whatever. Seraphita, I think. Yes, yes. They go to uh, the Fort Jasper yeah. and you fight them off. They they don't succeed but um, it takes two shots so Billy yeah, the fires first, one misses. first and he it was so funny because if you actually look on the screen where Billy's sitting in the chair it's, it's, you can yes, see the, the reticle off. is way off <laughs> <laughs> the reticle is like I love freaking that. like I don't know <laughs> like, 100 what? yards off <laughs> what are you doing dude <laughs> you can't fire yet man center that thing uh, so he misses um, yes <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> he, he's the hot shot. He knows what he's doing. And so Sutton's funny. like, okay, like, um, you know, no pressure here, but uh, you only get one more shot. So, <laughs> try yeah, Dominia, let's, let's like, they're, they're breaking through, yeah. So, the second <laughs> shot, direct hit, uh, it fires back into the, you know, right next to the headquarters, deep underground, destroys yep. the second gate. And the elements are forced to flee. So, yay, we succeeded at destroying the second gate generator. Yep. Um, <clears throat> So then we decide which side of the line yeah. the third gate's going to be on. It makes sense to go One to of the them, I thought it would go up there because there's a nice land mass in the middle. It's like, an, it's like the pole or ice yeah. pack kind of thing. And I was like, okay, maybe something like that. Um, but apparently they, it ends up being the one the underwater. Middle of the ocean, yep. And and we, do so, you feel like mm. these gates all came like pretty quickly? Yeah, you go through it pretty quick. Because when, when they mention, hey, we got three gates, we're going to find out where they you are, think we're going to have to destroy dungeons. them, it would be like a long yeah. thing. Um, but it was pretty dang fast. Yeah, yeah. you go through it. You, you destroy these pretty quick. Um, the one yeah. underwater in particular, it's like, I don't know, maybe four screens total. Yeah, but that one going through the tunnels is pretty yeah. pretty long. But It's like, eh, like not time wise, but distance wise. You travel far. <laughs> you travel like a great jumping. distance. Like, yes, and sometimes there's a current that like pushes. Yeah, you. there's a current that pushes you back. The, so I got the mm. feeling going through that because they had mentioned. I think it was the captain of the Thames. He said, um, "Oh, by the way, this is coming now. Several episodes after people pointed out. Yeah. So apparently, it's named after the River Thames, oh. which is a. It's just a, like an. It's pronounced Thames." Which well, that's how they say it in the Japanese, Tem is, but that's because they don't have a TH sound. Yeah, because that's the, <laughs> I guess it's after the river, and the river is spelled Thames in England, but it's pronounced ah, Thames. Ah, there you go. I got you. So, so they actually did spell it right. Thames. Thames. They spelled it correctly, but it's just pronounced Thames. Thames, not Thames. Yeah. Okay, good to know. So, we know that now. I'm not reading the comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so Thames. Yes. <laughs> 
tells us um, that some people people go down there and never come back, right? And yeah. that they swear that it's alive, right? Yeah. And the way that the um, the uh, what would you call it? The current kind of, you know, shoots in and pulls out. Gives it, it gives the impression that these are lungs that we're going into. Mm. We're going into a cradle of life. As you go down the first tube, then it branches, kind of like the bronchial tubes in the lungs. Yes. And then you keep going, and it branches again. Yeah. And um, anyways, it it, f it does feel like it's alive yeah. in different ways. And the way the current's going, it seems like the thing's breathing. breathing yeah. I thought there was going to be something crazy down here, and there kind <laughs> of wasn't. Um, but uh, yeah, it did. It kind of it did have that feeling. It kind of felt like like lungs that were yeah. alive. You get that imagery going down in. So before you get to this third dungeon with the last gate generator, uh, there's another scene with Kralian in the Gazel Ministry. This time. Ah, yes. A couple of really really important things here. Again, a lot of this stuff will sound like nonsense, um, but I just want to point out a couple things that are important to keep in mind. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> Kralian says. He mentions what's called the sign of the mother, mothers in quotes. He yes. says, her persona only appears after she reaches a certain age. And uh, there's also a high probability that she transmigrated into the antitype. So before that, um, actually, somebody mentioned how the mother probably exists among the lambs. Yeah. Um, and then they talk about this sign of the mother her persona only appears when she reaches a certain age and that she's transmigrated into what's called an antitype. So the Gazelle says the antitype, that woman from Nissan, yeah. or from Nissan. Yes, who looks like... Um, who, Sophia, who looks like Ellie. Who looks like Ellie, that's it, yeah. Right. Um, uh, so, okay. I mean, that's it, right? I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to put a spoiler warning just because people have been hounding me on this. So, okay. very short spoiler warning. But I, it's just going to be me talking about things the way that I have previously. I don't think it's a spoiler. <laughs> it's right here. <coughs> okay. We know that Sophia and Ellie are connected. Yes. Um, right? So, the mother is this, this type, this... Uh, they're referring to Sophia as the mother, right? Yeah. That this persona of the mother only appears at a certain age. Yeah. Right? So, and, and they're, they're <laughs> they are uh, speculating that the mother is with them right now. Yeah. With our group. Yes. It, it should not be like a freaking hard thing to put together they're talking about Ellie here. It's right? not if you played the game <laughs> up to the point, but yes, I did through reading, that's what my notes were. So the mother goddess has something to do with the Nissan lady and she has something to do with Ellie and also the colony girl is relevant, dot, 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 but I still don't get how. Okay. Th that's my note right there. But and it falls apart with the colony girl, but I can tell given things that Ellie has some subconscious Connection. Connection. And they've mentioned it before, too. That yeah. Has the girl, has she woken up? Something along those lines? Yes. She in quotes. I'm like, okay, that's Ellie. Um, and so that there's some godlike power dormant within her, just like there basically is within Faye. Yes. Yeah. Something going on with Faye and Ellie and these other time periods. And so yeah. what they're talking about is Ellie here. They're referring to her. Something about her. They're speculating about her, right? So there's an Ellie-like person 4,000 years ago. <laughs> Five, well, yeah, five hundred years ago, Krellian then and talks then today. about. Krellian is talking about here using the nano machine colony. Yes, Emerelda, which is how Emerelda is relevant. Emerelda yes. against them in this next will gate reveal place, and he says thing. that artificial organism, the nano machine co yes. colony Emerelda, was a creation between the contact and the antitype four thousand years ago. The contact. Yeah. So the contact is a new term that we want to. Keep in mind, but <laughs> it's the, like a hundred things I need to keep in I mind. I know, but right. the, the contact, but the antitype, they've already at least here connected to the mother. Yeah, the sign of the mother, her persona, only appears after she reaches a certain age. There is also a high probability that she transmigrated into the antitype. Into the antitype. so the mother is the antitype. Okay, so um, the persona within Jungian psychology is like how you present yes. yourself. I like wanted to the talk about outer, this. the outer yes. presentation shell. Yes. So your inner self 
is whatever it is. You don't even know. Nobody you're knows. Kind of your but, true self, right? Yeah, your true self, but you have to discover your true self. It's not that evident, right? Um, but your persona is what you craft according to your culture to make sure that you're presenting. So what people see as you is your persona, not your actual self, because that's yes. deeper. Yes. You know, it's yeah. like the mask that you wear to present yourself in sort of like public. In polite that's culture. At the work exactly. place yeah. or even with your family, uh, maybe extended family. Well, actually, interesting uh, note here, the games, the Persona games, um, always wearing masks, like Persona 5, he's got that yeah. mask on. The yeah. idea of a persona within that game also comes from Jungian psychology. Right. And that's the idea, right? That's it's the mask, it's is. your mask, right? And uh, everyone's actually, always wearing a mask. You may think you don't, but you do. Yeah. Um, I wrote down, I, I copied something um, here from um, Carl Jung's The Archetypes and the Collective Archetypes Unconscious. Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so he writes, persona is the individual system of adaption to or the manner he assumes in dealing with the world. Every calling of profession, for example, has its own characteristic persona. It is easy to study these things nowadays when the photographs of public personalities so frequently appear in the press. A certain kind of behavior is forced on them by the world, and professional mm -hmm. people endeavor to come up to these expectations. Only, the danger is that they become identical with their personas, the professor with the, his textbook, the tenor with his voice. The damage is done, henceforth he lives exclusively against the background of his own biography. For by that time it is written, then he went to such and such a place and said this or that, etc. One could say, with a little exaggeration, um, that the persona is that which is in reality one, oh, oh, sorry, I mean, butch, I butchered that a little bit. One could say, with a little exaggeration, that the persona is that which in reality one is not. Yes. But which oneself, uh, as well as others, thinks one is. Yes. And that's important. That's important, far reaching for your entire life to understand. Yeah. Your persona may be who you think you are. Yeah. And you aren't. Yes. Uh, yeah. Another quote from Jung, a kind of mask designed on the one hand to make de a definite impression upon others and on the other to conceal the true nature of the individual. Hmm. Now, that being said, I'm not sure I understand the use of persona here. <laughs> I think what they're um, just trying to say, I think they're just using these as proxies for conscious and subconscious. That. Her consciousness is Ellie, but her subconsciousness is, is the, the mother is the goddess. antitype. Yeah. Um, and I think that's because otherwise it doesn't make sense what they're saying because oh, then I see she that would know. I see that now. But what they're saying is that she doesn't know. Because I guess the reason I was that's confused the way I took it. is because it says her persona only appears after she reaches a certain age. But the it, goddess the persona, is persona. The, the, Right. But the goddess, we're talking about the goddess, is the real individual, right? Yes, the persona yes. would be the mask. So Ellie is the goddess, but but we're only seeing the mask. The actual goddess will come when she's of age, I guess. The actual goddess will take over the persona and shine forth take as a goddess. Take over the persona. As a goddess. Not once. that the persona appears, but the persona will the be per replaced by... Yeah, that's the way I read it. That's, that's the way I read it. Does that sound right? It, I mean, that's what I would think a yeah. proper use of persona would be. If, if they... But I think that it, the way it's written, it's confusing. Yeah. Because um, it's saying the persona only appears after she reaches a certain age instead of the persona the, will we be replaced sure. by the well, anti But you can wear a mask on top of a mask. I guess you could do that. But why would, why would you know, <laughs> that's, that's a weird thing. Anyways. But, I believe maybe Richard didn't read I as much think, Jung as he. <laughs> I think the idea is here that yeah. the real person will emerge at will a certain manifest, age. Will manifest, yes, at a certain age. Probably 18, because Ellie's Which is 17. what Ellie is right now. Right? <laughs> oh, okay, the 19. <laughs> yeah. 18 and a half. When they reach maturity, the, 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 the real individual underneath the persona, you know, emerges. Yeah. Okay. Now, how, how um, mm. Emeralda is relevant to this, I don't know. I thought I was kind of connecting a piece, and then all of a sudden it was turned around at the end of this playthrough uh, to where who Emeralda was kind of... kind of. So, uh, I'm just going to read on this one head. line again. I think it's Crowley that says it. That artificial organism was a creation between the contact and the antitype 4,000 years ago. Yes. Emeralda was a the creation, creation between the contact, between the contact and the antitype. And the 4,000 oh. years ago. 
We 4,000 years 4, ago? 4,000 years ago. The Zeboim era. Yeah. When we went down underneath the ocean where we got her from. So is that Ellie the anti-type and we're the contact? Okay. All right. I don't need so, to guess. Sorry. I'm just... We can probably <laughs> attain, or we can probably attain that some kind of reaction, is what he's saying. So it's like they're gonna, he's going to use Emerald in this battle to get some kind of reaction from Faye, right? Um, but that's, not that's, from Ellie. That's then what, the anti-type could be something else. Okay, cool. So, anyways, these are new terms. That yeah, they're so they're going to see how we react. This is kind of funny though, because the gazelle's like. Are you sure this is safe? What if the whole system is completely implodes? And Curlian's yeah. like, either way, we'll learn what we need to know, and she's useless to us after that point. Yeah. And it made me wonder what the gazelle's original purpose was for this nano colony. Because mm -hmm. it seems like they wanted it for something. Curlian shows up and says, no, let's use it for something else, and if it doesn't work, whatever you were going to do wasn't going to work anyways, so it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. And the gazelle are just like, all right. <laughs> All right. so, sounds about right. This is a win-win situation. <laughs> sure, I guess. But <laughs> they, they went to such great lengths to get this nano machine, and they're just willing to let it go now. But Corellian has that kind of influence. He has that yeah. kind of sway. When he tells them what to do, they kind of just do it. Yep. Okay, so end of spoilers on that. Then you reach the gate generator. Emerelda is already waiting for you in what I think is yeah. one of the coolest gear designs in the game. Yes. With those huge, like, wing antler things coming out of the head. Yeah, very, um, very cool. <clears throat> super sweet. I, it made her look a lot older, actually. I was thinking that she had aged uh, quite a bit. And I was like, wow, that's a rapid developing nano colony <laughs> or whatever. But then we see the sprite version of her, and she's just a kid. Have again, you so. fought with her on foot yet in the game? Mm, I don't think so. So I, I did a little bit of death mm -hmm. blow grinding before going to Solaris. I should have. I don't know why I didn't. Um, so I kind of grinded for everybody's yeah. death blows to My finish them all out. My party's too big now, man. There's <laughs> too many people. So... Um, one thing that's really cool about mm. her is because she's made of nano machines. Yeah. When she fights, particularly her hair will like transfigure into a weapon and like oh, that's pretty slice cool. or hammer people. Nice. Or, so she like kind of like morphs her body mm. into different like weapon shapes because oh, she's made of nano machines, right? Okay, cool. So that's kind of it's kind of a cool thing that like her hair is a big part of that when she fights on the ground, but she's got this hair in the gear that's kind of like these little green antler wing things. Each of the gears are kind of, um, they like relate to the person who pilots them in some way. Like we talked about Bart uses uh, like whips. Yeah, the whips, And uh, phases Billy all uses guns and Faye and Saiten do hand-to-hand -hand combat. And they yeah. all, I think even um, Ellie has like a baton or something, which is mm. like her weapon on foot as well. Anyways. Uh, baton's the worst yeah. weapon. <laughs> It's like a, it's like an electrified yeah, yeah, yeah. baton thing. But anyways. Um, yeah, but then there's that weird dude. I can't remember his name, but there's that crazy guy who just looks completely screwed up. Rattan? Yeah, Rattan. He is another experiment to put a consciousness into, uh, like Siebzen, to put a consciousness into a gear. Like not Siebzen. What was the 18? What's 18? O Oxen. 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 Because um, he says, I would show you my face. But... I'm just a consciousness embedded in a machine. Yeah, this is my face now. Yeah. But he, you know, he, it's, it's, it's weird. And the way he moves, I don't know if it's because of the sprites, but he just looks like jittery and just yeah. like not right, like something's wrong with him. Um, and he, he doesn't do a ton other than he's, go and he's report. He's there to observe and collect data for Krellian. Krellian. That's it. Because I was thinking, what happens when we fight this dude? But it's like, oh. He's mm. just there to, he literally shows up to be like, okay, so I'm the scientist here. Yes. I'm going to you, watch you fight. You fight you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> <Take notes>. Boom, <laughs> leave. Very interesting. I must report this. Goodbye. Yes, yes, bye. But he does say a couple of um, important things here. Ah, uh, yes, he does. Uh, particularly after the fight's over. So he's like making his observations after you, you fought uh, with Emerella's gear. He says, um, you should view it as a release of memory. He's talking about what's happening with... Um, Emerelda, in yes, because she's because like, she Kim. starts like she starts saying like Kim, Kim, Kim or something, and she like that. starts twitching, and, and he's saying you should view it as a release of memory or maybe a recording. It turned out just as Krellian said, it is a manifestation of the imprinting. At any rate, it is proven. With that, excuse me, I must report the results. Oh yes, go ahead and take the girl. Use her anywhere you like. After all, she is your daughter. In quotes, and then he pieces up. <laughs> That's crazy. So my note that I took there was Emerald is our daughter. Scientist Faye wouldn't let them have her 500 or wait 
4,000 years ago. Yep. I remember when Ellie was on the floor, the door was shut, we're yep. behind and it, there's the green haired girl behind us. Yep. But he says something interesting here about the imprint, that there's um, an imprint happened, meaning that she was created and we were there. She may not be our like, like literal daughter, but we were there when she was created and so she imprinted on us as yes. her father. Yes. So that's what I kind of took it as, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like a literal daughter. But, um, and then um, she like disappeared or just was sealed away for like thousands of years. Long time. But this is dating back to the 4,000 years ago Faye, which now we know his name is Kim. Yes, because she keeps calling Kim, 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 yeah. Kim. And then and when he says, like, I'm Faye, she goes, okay, Faye Kim, or Faye's Kim. Or, um, <laughs> yeah, something Faye, like Faye that. Faye no Kim, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Faye no Kim. Um, so, you know, they're trying to, like, work it out. <laughs> I thought it was really heartless of Faye. He's like, what the hell is it saying? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> she, keeps, she keeps going, Kim, 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 Kim. <laughs> His oh, response so is, funny. what the hell is it saying? <laughs> I was like, oh, come on, Faye. Come on, man. <laughs> well, and then Ellie gets upset, too, because... um. She's trying to talk to Faye and Ellie steps in and like, hey, you know, we uh, we just kind of showed up and you were, and she's like, shut up, woman. Who's yeah. this old lady? <laughs> <laughs> Who's this old lady? Yeah, that's right. I'm which talking is funny. to Kim right now. <laughs> w which is funny because the person outside of the door laying on the ground in blood 4,000 years ago s appeared to be Ellie. Um, but And this is part of where I would make the connection that, okay, it's not the actual daughter because I would have assumed that Kim and that woman had something to do with each other, but then... Kim protected this girl, but the girl has nothing to do with the girl who died who looks like Ellie. Otherwise, she'd have said, oh, and you're the other girl yes. that I know. She didn't say that. She just cares about Faye. Right. So, and she's just a colony. She was made from machines. So <laughs> she is not um, his So, actual yeah, mother. the imprinting on to Kim, or Faye in this case, right? Yeah. She, she thinks he's Kim. And um, I, I think Saiten says something really interesting here. Mm. Um, he says... For her, Kim means more than just a name. Ah, it's like a title. It's, it's like, like a like title a, thing. Yeah, it's not it's just a name. more like father or something yes, like that. Yes, So uh, this girl, Emerilda, thinks that, Ke that, Ke that Faye is Kim. Yep. Who she views or has imprinted and as a And Faye father. just kind of is like, we'll just go along with it. Okay. I'm like, all right, you Sounds can follow good. me around. Like, let's do it. Well, I'm, I'm you Kim. You can come with us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he just accepts it. What do you think about the music for the Emerilda fight? Oh, it's it beautiful. It was very slow and, yep. and classical. This it was not what I thought it like was going to be. Like a battle theme. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. a battle theme at all. And that's like, that was my first hint that this is like, it's so unsettling when you enter a battle and the battle music is not playing. Yeah. And it, it just makes you kind of second guess everything that's been happening. Is this really a bad guy? What's happening here? Who is this person? Why did the music stop? It's more ominous. Like, yeah. am I going to die <laughs> like right <laughs> away? Like something weird and important is happening. And the, so you got the use of music, then the use of the absence of music, and then the specific track that they play here. Which is like uh, I didn't recognize it. So, did um, you? Do you know where that's the, from? The the title of the piece is called June Mermaid, I think. Hmm. Is this the first time that we've heard it? This is the first time we've heard. Okay, because I thought so, but I couldn't mm -hmm. tell if it was um, based on a different track. That's a beautiful song. Oh, let me turn this up. Yeah, it's a music box. Yeah, like a music box. So we get a music box sound. Which elicits the image of a child, yeah. right? Of a, a baby in in its cradle in its yeah. infancy. Yeah, this was very unsettling. Yeah, this to was, fight somebody this while a music box is playing music in the background. That was used in that boss fight against yes. Emerald. Yes, very cool, very artistic. I thought it was a very effective choice. Yeah, June Mermaid is one of my favorite tracks from the game. <clears throat> um, mm. There's a really really good version of it on the Myth, um, the the Myth uh, album which was like mm -hmm. a, an orchestral Xeno oh, Gears. Nice. Like it has like six or eight tracks on it or something like that that are different orchestral arrangements mm. of uh, Xeno Gears tracks. But um, in any case, uh, yeah, June Mermaid, it's really great. Cool. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh yeah, so then what happens, if we're done talking about Emerilda? Yes. Okay. So what happens then? I wrote this down because this is so funny. So Satan goes, okay, guys, what do we do now? Ugh. Somehow we have to figure out how to get to Solaris. <laughs> and then a dude walks up. <laughs> Sir, we got a transmission from Shavat. They found out how to get into Solaris. And Satan's <laughs> like, 
great, let's go. <laughs> like, and so I, it, there are a few hints that they were running out of time to yeah. really make this game. Kinda and one of them is the how they transition no. from thing transition, to thing. Transition, how to go from yes. where to here to this scene. Because well, they know where scene. they need to go, but the transitions. And then they're you like, know, let's just have I've, them. A dude comes and then they just go, okay? I've they just go. We got to move on. I've always wondered about this because... At least at Squaresoft, mm -hmm. right? Because I've done a lot of research on how these games during this time period were developed. And it was not uncommon after the uh, NES era to have, like, or, or after the, yeah, after the NES, moving into the Super NES era and beyond that, mm. to have multiple writers on different scenes. Yeah. So it's like you go write scene A, B, and uh, F. And you go write scene C, uh, M, and <laughs> Q, and you go write, you know. And so they're all writing different scenes. Yeah. But my question while researching this was, how do they then connect the end of this guy's scene to the beginning yeah. of this guy's scene? And make it flow how, and, yeah. I, I always wondered if they would huh. go finish their event scenario. Yeah. And then they would come together and watch and go, okay. And they would like talk between Determine each how other. To juxtapose. How do we transition between those things? Yeah. And hmm. it seems like, again, this is speculation, but it seems to me like as they were running out of time, these guys were coming together. How do we transition? And Mazata Kata was like, do a narration. <laughs> you know? <laughs> or uh, just have someone call them in <laughs> and they yeah. just know where to go. Just tell like, them to go. Because. Yeah, uh, that it does sounds feel right. Rough. I don't know, but that sounds like that's possible. Yeah, or plausible. Because uh, yeah, I mean, if if anybody has insight onto this, it's just something I've always wanted to know. Yeah. How do? Because I mean, yeah, multiple when, like yeah. script writers in film, that can be done by you know sometimes two writers or something. Right. But it's not common to have like four or five different people writing different scenes. So yeah, <laughs> and then. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe that is the way scripts. I, I just not heard of examples. Because like I on, know of on one Lord example. of the Rings, you had um, Fran Walsh, Fran Walsh, Philip Boyens. Yeah, and then Peter Jackson. Peter, but he was not doing as much of the writing as the other two. He was just kind of again directing. Yeah, over he was scene. the director, but he would probably do this. He'd say, "Okay, that seems great, but I don't like how we transition. Yeah, He'd change this part to make it more smooth or something like that." Yeah, but I don't. I don't know. I don't. I just. It's just. Interesting. It's a different approach to like writing than I think you see in other uh, industries or even just yeah. in the West. You, you typically don't have like a like huge team writers. of writers like that. All it's one writing thing to have a different. team writing the same scene. Yes. and someone writes and then they go, "Oh, I'm going to go through what you wrote, and then yeah. I'm going to go through what you wrote, and we'll pu we'll pull our um, notes together and like strengthen the scene." It's yeah. so another thing. You go do three unconnected freaking scenes and you go do like these yeah. unconnected and scenes. And then you just write this one character. You write this character's backstory yeah. and you write that character's backstory and somehow we're gonna make those all work together. It, yeah. it seems like there would be a long process after it's all written to make it work, you know, it's to make it connect. It's amazing that this game is as cohesive as it is, given <laughs> what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> because I, although that's probably true of a lot of games, that's probably, yeah. it's amazing that any game works, having different writers focusing on different areas and then coming together later to yeah. make everything connect. It's amazing any game flows and works. Like, for instance, um, I mean, uh, the, 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 it's this is why it's, um, this is how you find like if uh, if someone plagiarized some kind of ancient document or something, right? Yeah. You, there's there's patterns in the way each person writes. Yes. That when you yes. study that, you run it through your algorithm long enough, you can pick up their certain habits or just like style of a way one person writes, and you can say this yeah. person wrote this. This is not written by a different author who lived, you know. A thousand years ago, this was plagiarized. Right. Right. This was written by this person because yes. their styles match. And th so they right? call it a, a void or um, yeah, but they, the style. So more or less, yeah. when you have this writer writing dialogue for this character in this scene, but this writer is writing dialogue for that same character in this in scene. In a different scene. The danger is that the character is they not going to sound, sound consistent. The same. They won't yeah. sound like themselves yeah. between different scenes. So that's typically why you don't want to have multiple writers writing dialogue and stuff. Yeah. You want one person you, maybe to write, different scenario and you or, want a good editor and you yeah. want, you know, you can have a team of people who give voice as to, 
here's how we should structure the story, mm -hmm. and you know, maybe we need to tighten this up or whatever. But usually you don't want to have like lots of people actually doing the, the words to page yeah. writing. But they did that in a lot of their games during this time. Yeah. Yeah, have you ever, yeah, I think you did watch this with us actually, Cowboys and Aliens, remember that movie? I don't think I saw that. You didn't watch actually. it? I don't oh, think dang. I think I missed out on that one. That movie's based on a script that was bought and sold and bought and sold. Steve like Oden Steve wrote, wrote the, the original very first. Yep. It was like what he the did, bitch? and he's credited in the movie, although it is not at not all his what script. he had originally written. It was supposed to be a serious yes. like. Thing. There <laughs> are probably six different like writers. Well, I can't remember exactly how many. You guys would have to look it up. But there's a lot of writers credited on that Movies, movie. Yeah. And that movie was as disjointed as any movie that you'll ever watch. Yeah. It was it was alright, but it wasn't a very good movie. Yeah. And that's possibly the reason why. <laughs> they have yeah. too many hands. They say too many cooks in the kitchen, yeah. right? Each one has their own ideas of what to do. And then how do you get a cohesive whole out of that? Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, th that could be a result of that. Just yeah. How do we transition from this to this? I, I don't know, man. Just I don't know. You get called in from Shavat. They figured out what to do. They, okay, now let's go. Because <laughs> I already thought destroying the gates was quick enough. Now I'm like, okay, well, getting to Jebler, that's going to be the. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> we're there before we knew it. Like ten minutes later, we were in. We were in uh, Solaris. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. So that so all happened kind of quick. But I you all go it. meet up in Shavat. Shavat, yeah. And they basically say. Um, Maria, you're going to pilot. Well, here's one thing I noticed. I don't know if mm -hmm. you picked this up. I was actually watching some old footage as I was editing. Maria is never actually inside of the season. Yes, she stands on she top stands of it. She stands on top of it. Yes. Even from the first time I you did, battle her. I did figure that out. She's always standing on top of it. And so she pilots it via her brainwaves I, I, outside I, I'm, I'm of actually, it. I'm actually, I'm actually right? not sure if she's piloting the Zeebsen. It has its own... Remember, because she acted, tells it, it what to she, do, though. I think so. It will only but work I don't for know, her. I don't know if it's. I don't know if she's she's brain if connected it's that to it. Kind of gear, or I see if what it's you mean. like she it just does what she says. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right because it's <laughs> programmed like, by her, her father, father to, in some way, and, and so she. But she's never inside of the gear. Huh, she's always standing on it, almost know, like it's even her flying pet or something, like a thousand miles an hour yeah, over the she's, ocean. She's just standing on top of it. <laughs> Which is interesting. But I think that's a good point, actually, because the, the mind connection was being researched. She would have had to put her mind into the thing in order to just control it but by her mind. Because her dad didn't figure did it out. That. Nikolai put like his himself. own mind into yeah. the Simpson. Yeah. So anyways, it was just interesting. I hadn't and noticed And Oxen. He did, kind of did both. He well, put a Oxen little here. Is, like his actual body is inside of that. Is like merged. So his current like brainwashed so he, like, Nikolai hooked it all up. is wired yeah. into that one. Okay, that makes sense. But I think but then that he his, did part some of his kind mind. of like consciousness yeah, copy it seems so. or something, or, or just some part of his personality or some recording of himself went into the Siebson. Yeah. And that, anyways. It'll some, only someone, listen to her. That makes sense. I expect that someone will probably correct us on this point in the comments. Okay, we can Because I'm not 100% sure on this. But I'm, it's just, I found it interesting. I, I was like, oh my gosh, she's never actually inside hmm. of the thing. She's I noticed this last time I noticed that she was on top of it. But. And I mean, it's been that way. I mean, it's in battles, like mm. when, the, when you're just fighting and you got her in the party, like she's her little sprite just like standing up there That's on so top funny. of the thing as it fights. That's cool. So yeah, interesting stuff. But uh, she's going to break through the, the gate. because Yeah, she has her particle the, cannon. The cannon that's going to actually be able to break yeah. through. Um, so they all plan on that. Um, they, they settle on that. But this is where they start to, uh, this is pretty explicit, they start to really start casting some doubt on Saiten. Yes, d uh, directly. And Billy does it. Saiten's going through his own internal thing. And then... Yui and... and Yui, and, that's um, it. Yui's like, are you sure you can really... Yeah, Jesse too. ...do yeah. the thing you need to do. So I copied yeah. some of the dialogue here. So he's having a conversation with his wife, Yui. Yes. In Shabbat, up on the top tower thing. Um, she says, you're going, aren't you, to Solaris? And he says, yes, I've chosen my own path. There's no turning back. And she says, you will be hurt. They will also be hurt. And he says, indeed. But I could not find any other path to choose. If I happen to be overcome by the dark side, at that point, I've already... And then he kind of trails off. She says, don't say anything more. I already know. Right. And then she gives him a sword. Yes. 
and it's like he's it's almost like ceremonial <laughs> yeah she gives him a sword and he takes it um, and then the, the so the next scene is the really interesting one he's like walking down the stairs from that tower where he was talking to his wife he's like going down the stairs from and there Billy's and there. and Jesse is oh there. Jesse I say Billy I meant <laughs> he's yeah. he's sitting there waiting for him and he says listen Hugo I'm going to Solaris too don't misunderstand me it doesn't mean I'll help you I don't know what you're thinking or trying to do, but if you take their side, I'll kill you without a doubt. Yeah, I will shoot you in the back. Yeah. Even in the back. Yes. And Sighton's So that's his reason for going, <laughs> yeah. is to kill he's, Sighton. He's, he's keeping Jesse his eyes on Sighton. Jesse is going to kill Sighton if Sighton doesn't take funny. Takes their side. Yeah. And Sighton says, yes, I'll be counting on that. So it almost sounds like Sighton has an id within himself that he can't control either. And that if something happens, he's like, do away with me. It's what Nikolai did. It's kind of a theme that seems to be happening here where it's like there is something else that I'm working on, but if I can't do it, then then you kill me, right? Yep. Kind of thing. It, so whatever happens, if Saiten turns or does something, it almost feels like it's not necessarily of his own conscious yeah, he's, he's worried that that something, something else might overcome him. He's going to overcome him, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of mystery surrounding Solaris. I mean, we've, we, you know, he and Sigurd have explained a little bit about the things going on there. But now yeah. we're going there ourselves, and we're going to learn what's really going on inside of here. What are the? We're going to get more of the yeah. secrets of Solaris revealed, and that's for next week. That's next time, people. <clears throat> Again, I will uh, pin as the top comment. Uh, where to play up to next time. I, I, I would hope that we can get all the way through the Solaris section of the game. Oh, sick. To where, at least up to the point where we, where we leave Solaris. But um, I will determine that for sure based on how much content there's going to be to break down. And there's yeah. going to be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be a lot. So um, I'll let you know as the pin to come. So uh, anyways, thanks for watching, everybody. Appreciate you very much. And we'll see you next week.